Okay, our speaker today is Miguel Sicart. Uh, Miguel um, is a game studies scholar. He's done lots of other things uh, in philosophy and liter literary studies, uh, philosophy of technology, and so forth. He has his PhD from the IT University in Copenhagen, which is a great place. Uh, he's also on the faculty there in the Center for Computer Games Research. That's still what it's That's called. That's great. Right? Okay, yeah. good. Uh, this year, though, he's on sabbatical leave yeah. at UC Santa Cruz, which is um, what we're taking advantage of in having him here today. Um, by the way, he also has an MA in literary theory and a BA in Spanish philo philology. I think those are two things we have not yet said in the lecture series, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, in, anyway, though, uh, I want to, as the last thing in introducing him, I want to say that he has uh, monopolized the field of ethics and computer games. Uh, he has three books, um, not one, not two, but three books from MIT Press, Play Matters, uh, the second, Beyond Choices, The Design of Ethical Gameplay, and the third, The Ethics of Computer Games. Again, all of these are available from MIT Press. So, Miguel, take it away. This feels like coming back home to me for this topic, because um, I'll, I'll say in a second, but I've, I've moved a little bit away from just thinking about video games and, and I'm, I've, I've moved more into the direction of, of play, and I've moved also a little bit away from core ethical uh, work, and I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm nowhere, which is great. It feels, it feels really good. So, so this is a little bit coming back home to a, to a topic and a field that I really, uh, well, I built my, my early career on, um, and it's a, a, it's a field that I'm still very, very interested in. But I'm also going to test to see how deep the waters are in other topics that are also uh, related with ethics, related with play, um, but I, I, I'm only now starting to work with. So some of the, particularly the last part of the, of the presentation is going to be uh, some kind of play test. So play test of ideas. Um, anyway, so I'm going to walk you today through three topics, um, video game ethics, um, or how can we think morally about video games or computer games. Um, that will lead me to a second topic, major topic, which would be how to design ethical gameplay. So how can we design experiences for players that um, engage them as moral beings? So we want to entertain them, but we also want to engage them as moral thinking beings. So how can we design um, those kind of experiences? And the third a uh, part which is going to be a little bit broader is, well, given the nature of play as an activity and the way we consider it uh, currently, both in, in general in culture but also in play studies, um, so uh, how can we connect play and ethics in a, in a meaningful way beyond video games? Because um, Henry introduced me and, and, and sort of uh, let you know that I have a history in studying video games and I used to be a game scholar. You introduced me as a game scholar. but I'm not a game scholar anymore. I'm pretty bored of video games. I shouldn't be saying this here, right? You're not going to kick me out. Uh, I don't like video games anymore. I kind of grew tired of them. Um, so I started my career as a game scholar. I wanted to uh, think deeply about the cultural and uh, philosophical importance of video games. And that's why I wrote my PhD on uh, computer game ethics or video game ethics, and that's my first book, The Ethics of Computer Games, where I try to um, sort of present a little bit my um, own take on how to think ethically about video games. And that led to a second work that was sort of the sequel. Um, I was not allowed to entitle it The Ethics of Computer Games 2, so I had to come up with a new title, Beyond Choices, where I just focused on I took a given. So given that players can be moral beings, how can we design for them? As a design question, not as a philosophical question. And then after these two projects, I grew tired of video games because video games are boring. Sorry. I just think they are, as a medium, they are, if we just think about video games, if we just obsess about video games, I think we are missing out on something greater. I think games are great props. They are great instruments, they are great tools, but the ways we can use them, the way we can harness them, is through play. So I'm not, a, I'm not anymore a games scholar, don't tell my bosses, I'm a play scholar. Because if, if I say I'm a play scholar, I will be shoveled into the, I don't know, um, uh, folk studies department instead of being on an engineering school or in a, in a computer science department, which is where I want to be. I want to be with people that don't think like me. So I'm a play scholar. And I'm also, sort of philosophically speaking, I'm, I'm very much of a classicist. I'm, my ethics, my ethical theory is uh, virtue ethics. I'm a virtue ethicist. 
And, at, and as such, I'm, I'm deeply Aristotelian. I like Aristotle. I'm very, very old-fashioned. Everything I'm going to present today has uh, its roots on a virtue ethics vision of philosophy. So I'm not going to say that my theory is the right one. I'm just going to say my virtue ethics theory is the one that I think it's more productive to think about the role of video games in culture and the effect they have on our moral lives. So you can disagree with me if you're a Kantian, if you're a, a consequentialist, if you're a justice consequentialist. All those disagreements are very accepted because I start and I, I don't hide myself, I'm an Aristotelian. But when I think about design, which is um, the last two uh, books I've, I've written, uh, they have a strong design component, I am very much uh, connected to third wave HCI. And these two connect very well, as I hope I will prove in a second. I am uh, fascinated and very much interested in uh, embodied interaction. So I'm not interested exclusively on sort of how to design the, the sort of the type of cognitive design that, that was second wave HCI, but I'm interested in third wave HCI, embodied cognition, ubiquitous computing. How can we think beyond the screen, beyond the classic interaction patterns of mouse and keyboard? How can we think about that? And how can we bring ubiquitous computation to uh, a more cre a creative, playful environment? Um, so that's me in, in a nutshell. I'm an Aristotelian that likes to work with computers. And that's exactly what I've been doing for a while. So um, part one of this presentation is going to be on the ethics of computer games. And this is going to be old work. It's been, uh, I've presented it on my, on my first book. Uh, that's the title, The Ethics of Computer Games. And it all started with um, some kind of both um, observation and intuition, which was clearly there's something going on with computer games. When I was growing up, playing computer games, playing video games was not right. It was a waste of time. It was a waste of time. I used a lot of energy in, but it was a waste of time. It was not considered to be a creative activity. It was not culture as reading. It was not culture as listening even to pop music. Pop music was better than video games. And yet at some moment, particularly in the 1990s, we started thinking about video games as something that is not important, yet they have a strong effect in culture because Obviously, everybody who plays violent video games wants to, st wants to start shooting at each other, right? How many of you have played violent video games? How many of you have started shooting at each other right now? Because then I have to duck and cover. <laughs> None, right? So to me, there's a clear disconnect there. There's a popular discourse that says video games will have an effect on your moral being, but we don't know how that effect works. And in fact, when we try to do effect studies, we are ignoring, as a philosopher, we are ignoring to me the most important question, which is how does that affect our moral fabric? Yes, it's true. We play violent video games and we may have some physical arousal because violent video games are hyperkinetic interactions that appeal to some of our core instincts. But not only violent video games. Now I have to confess, now that I'm on camera, I have to confess, I've destroyed to date five PlayStation controllers playing FIFA. <laughs> I never get more violent than playing FIFA. I've played all of the Call of Duties and they, are, they just mellow me out. Put me in front of a soccer game and I'm just rabid. Um, they do have an effect, right? But somehow we can control that effect. Like we can control the effect of many other things, right? We can read books that are provoking and they inform us. We can listen to music that it's aggressive and it will enlighten us. We can see movies or watch movies that are deeply provoking as well. And we take them in, we process them, and they become a part of our moral environment. So how does that work with video games? So that led me to think before we even do any kind of physical psychological evaluation of um, how do video games affect us, we need to know, do we have an ethical theory that allows us to know what impact do they have in our moral being. And as such, I am, again, being deeply Aristotelian. I think we are all moral beings. And being, so this, this moral being is, is kind of the keystone of our own being. Everything that happens is based on this moral being that we work with. It's based on these virtues. So as such, what I wanted to do uh, with this first work is to figure out who is this moral being that plays video games and how do we as ethical agents interact with these systems, process them 
and enrich our lives with them. And incidentally, when it goes wrong, when some people get actually negatively affected by playing video games in their moral being, how does that happen? Because it happens. It happens that some people get affected uh, by playing um, video games of, of dubious moral content. And so how can we deal with it? How can we deal with what I think are the exceptions? And for that, of course, I had to take some assumptions. And all of this, I'm a philosopher, evidence is... Uh, I, I always joke that I'm a philosopher, so I don't need evidence. I just talk until people give up. Um, so, but my, my assumptions are, as you probably can hear now, very Aristotelian. First one is, we cannot think about video games as just a form of entertainment or a thing that we just purchase and engage with. We need to see them as a human practice. It's something that we not only engage once, it's a repetitive action that builds with us, that, that creates a practice that goes with us um, throughout all of our life. It's like playing sports, it's like playing card games, playing video games, pl has exactly the same type of practice role. It's something that we do repetitively, that we engage with throughout our uh, individual histories, collective histories, and it's something that plays a role in our um, um, cultural development and personal development. So playing video games is a part of, of, of who we are. Playing games in general is a part of who we are. Playing video games is a part of who we are as moral beings. But the key idea is the, is the, word, of, uh, is the word practice. Because as Ar Aristotle said, ethics is a practical science. It's something that we need to practice, to engage with continuously, to develop over time. And therefore, if I want to uh, think about the ethics of video games, I need to think about the practice of playing video games in its context. Because playing video games is never a solitary act. You're never playing games alone. You're always a part of a community. Even if you go to a cabin and play a single-player game offline, when you get out of that cabin, when you get in touch with other human beings, that, that experience of playing that game is going to be informing whatever relations you have with other human beings. Mostly when you talk about that particular game you have experienced, but in general. Video games play a role in our being as a community uh, or, or as a communitarian being. Playing video games plays a huge role in how we present ourselves to others. And finally, machines play a very important role in the configuration of this ethical moral experience. So we cannot we cannot say that video games are neutral objects. Video games, as designed objects, like any designed object, has uh, embedded values in them that we engage with. So this is, in summary, playing video games, it's a human practice that it's never individual and it's somehow um, started and engaged with, with a system that it's not morally neutral. These were my assumptions. Uh, and of course, with these assumptions, um, Aristotle made a lot of sense. Because by seeing things as a practice, I can think about, okay, well, what we do when we play video games is we build virtues. We become better players when we play video games. And of course, the word better and the word virtue is complicated. I'm, I'm a cheating Aristotelian because I've written a whole book on virtue ethics without explaining what the, what the virtues of being a good video game player are. Uh, don't tell Aristotle that he would be very annoyed. Um, but I think that to play video games is to develop the virtue of being or becoming a good player, individually and in community. So, um, my argument is the ethics of computer games needs to be seen as a constructivist ethics of a human subject that plays a game in a community and that game is designed with a particular set of values that the player needs to read, interpret, analyze and accept or reject. So, the ethics of computer games is uh, the ethics of interpreting, or, or the ethics of a computer system and a human being interpreting each other. And of course, this leads to, um, I guess, the key argument. Oh, this is this is rendered terrible. Sorry. The key argument in my first book, which is the existence of something called a ludic hermeneutic circle. Um, this is, of course, pulled from Gadamer, um, and the idea here is that. When we play any game, we start on a zero, some kind of a serious slate. We create what I call a player subject. It's a subjectivity, moral subjectivity, that um, 
perceives or, or um, engages with a video game and uh, has a particular um, sort of goal with that activity of play. So the player subject um, wants to engage in, in a particular game for a particular purpose. I want to play a game for escapism. I want to play a game to challenge myself in terms of skills. I want to play a game to learn more about a particular topic. That's the zero level player subject. And that's what we are developing constantly when we are playing. We develop who we are as players. That's the, that's the, um, the key element to me. We, as players, we are a particular type of subjectivity that's connected but separate from our day-to-day -day subjectivity. I'll go in, in, into the details of how we are connected but separate in a second. So this player subject perceives this game and is um, somehow first uh, uh, shaped by the affordances and the constraints of the game design. So all games have a particular affordances and constraints. They, they have uh, ways of, of telling you what you want to do and ways of telling you what you do not want to do. So, of course, a, a, a shooter game wants you to engage in agonistic conflict play. It wants you to shoot other things. And that's okay. I'm not saying that's, that's a wrong thing. It's a type of agonistic play that that's fine. It wants you to engage in, in that type of play. And for that, it's going to afford a particular set of discourses that I think have value. For instance, the enemy is always evil. Always. You're, you have no doubt that you are a hero. Your values are those of a hero. So engaging in conflict has to be presented as a heroic activity. Because then we start building this player subject and we start thinking, well, doing this kind of agonistic conflict play makes sense. Um, this is what I want to do if I want to play with this game. Now, if we only did what the video game told us, if we took these affordances for, from the game system and did that, we would be... Um, negating all the other elements that actually conform this player subjectivity, this interpretational process. So the first thing we do is interpret the game system. What does the game want me to do? But then that reading, that first player subject, starts getting filtered in a circular process. First by something I've called the individual player. We've all been playing games all of our lives. And because playing games, it's a practice, we've been developing skills. We may be really good with uh, hand-eye coordination or really good with pattern matching. But we've also been developing values. You should not be a quitter. You should not be a cheater. You should not be a griefer. To play games historically has also been the act of learning how to play. Learning the values and virtues of the games you want to play. Some People do not want to engage in competitive games because they dislike competition. That's one of their virtues. Some other people are extremely competitive and will not like games or play activities that are not competitive. Because to compete is one of their core values. And throughout time, we develop this uh, individual likeness and individual virtues for uh, what we think, who we think we are as individual players. So for instance, I am not a very competitive person. I hate competitive games, except FIFA, <laughs> which is it's a dark secret. Um, so games that are clearly trying to push me to, to beat others makes me feel uneasy. I enjoy, the, however, cooperative games, because I think one of my core values is that play is a shared activity with which we can all enrich each other. We can explore many interesting uh, um, social structures, collaborative structures, by playing together rather than playing against each other. But if many, most people are competitive players, so you, you appreciate the, the virtue of playing against others and showing that you're better by, because you're better with, your skills are better, your knowledge is better, you know, you like winning at, at uh, football, at uh, lacrosse, at Trivial Pursuit, all of those games. So that, that's another core value. And that informs your reading of that initial set of affordances of the game. That makes you play that game in a particular way. Take only some of those affordances 
and ditch the others, or even ditch the game completely. I'm not interested in playing this game because I'm not interested in playing this kind of activity. And of course, I've been talking about abstract types of virtues, but it can also be very concrete. I used to love Grand Theft Auto games, but I don't like them anymore because they are infantile. I've grown out of them. I think the discourses on gender, race, and violence are hideous. And I'm not going to play them, even if they are great games. Because my own development of virtue says, like, no, that's not, that's not who I want to be when I play a video game. Now, the process does not stop there. We first start with that subject, we modify it with our own history and our own virtues as a player, as players, not necessarily as human beings, as subjects external to the game. And then we go into community player, as a player that, that is a part of a community. How do I want to play this game? How do the others want me to play this game? Um, if you go to massive multiplayer online games and you play by the rules, people are going to hate you. Because nobody plays by the video game rules in those games. We all take a crazy mixture of video game rules, what the game allows us to do and does not allow us to do, community rules, which is what the community of players accepts and does not accept as valid and valuable activities, and um, we blend them into our own community player. Who are we going to be in this community? Who do we want to, uh, how do we want to be a part of a community when we are playing? And the same goes for single player games. When we, when we play video games, we want to be a part of a discourse. And the way we play the games will actually allow us to engage in the discourse of that particular community. We want to play games in a particular way so we can discuss, talk about them, make them a part of who we are in our cultural landscape. Because video games always have, uh, um, always play a role in our sort of general entertainment ecology. They are not isolated objects. They are a part of what makes us uh, interesting cultural human beings. So we relate individually, we relate community, and the final step of interpretation is that of the subject external to the game. So we may sort of uh, read some assumptions, engage individually with these um, um, uh, affordances of the game through our own player history, look at them as a community player, what do other players do, but sometimes there are taboos that we don't want to play with that have nothing to do with the game. They can be you know, personal triggers, they can be cultural triggers, they can be all kinds of uh, external elements that affect the creation of that player, uh, player subject. And then we go back here. So we start by uh, starting on a clean slate looking at the game and then we, by interpreting that game, by interpreting that activity of playing, we go back to the subject and we say, well, I'm going to play this game and I've I've, it's going to help me develop as a, as a player subject because I'm going to play it it's according to my uh, individual um, interests. I know how the community plays and I want to be a part of that community and it's not breaking any of the cultural taboos that I'm uh, uh, a part of. So for instance, it's, it's really interesting uh, what some of these cultural taboos and, and the role they have. In Japan there are rape games and just the idea of having rape video games, it's terrible, right? It's unthinkable. Except in Japanese culture, they have a role. Because their externality, their, their, their sort of the values uh, they place on the activity of play is different than we do in, in the Western world. And therefore, they can have topics that we would never deal with through a game uh, um, embodied in a video game. Um, I, for instance, so we all have sort of individual uh, 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 topics, right? I would never play a, a Spanish Civil War game because it's just, it's too much rooted in my own family history to think that it's a fun topic to play with. You know, it's, it's messed up enough of, of, of families, uh, of, of relatives, uh, that that's not, a, that's not a topic I'm going to deal with. Even if the game is interesting, even if it doesn't go against any of my uh, a virtues as a player, even if the community, I would like to be a part of it, I would never play a game about the Spanish Civil War because it just kind of breaks my creation of, of, of a player subject. So this is what we do when we play video games. We are constantly interpreting and seeing how can we develop these particular virtues. So um, 
in a nutshell, when we play, we are de developing a moral being. And this moral being is both connected and disconnected with our uh, real life being. It's what the philosopher, the, the German philosopher Barbara Becker calls a, a, a subject, uh, skin subject, I've called it a player skin. We take a skin, right? And phenomenologically, a skin is a really interesting uh, metaphor because the skin is both what puts us in touch with the world but separates us from it. And when we play, we take on a skin that allows us to be detached from who we are but yet connected with who we are outside of the game. And in that tension is where we start developing a number of values, a number of virtues. Uh, the things that engage us as, um, as human beings and as um, creative players. And most importantly, we practice them. These are not things that we learn in school, but we also learn them in school. These are not things that we learn at home, but we also learn them at home. These are things that we constantly, every time we play, we are engaging with. So even when we are playing for fun, with nothing at stake, we are training our own moral values and moral virtues as a video game or a game player. We are always practicing our own morality when we are playing games. And games can be used directly to engage with that morality. They can be used directly to affect and, and, and challenge and, and modify who we are as moral beings. So I guess the key idea I wanted to put uh, forth in, in that first work on the ethics of video games is that it's everything about the player and how we interpret video games. It's everything about how we accept a particularly, a particularly designed object, how we uh, historically work with it as our own personal history as players, how we embed in a community, and how even uh, for the most uh, um, experimental players, there's always taboos that we will not play with. That's the ethics of games. It's the ethics of, of the practice of a set of values and, and virtues that can be found in the activity of playing games. I'll give you just some quick examples. Um, these are old examples, they come from my, my ethics book, um, but they show some interesting elements. So the, I, I was writing my dissertation when World of Warcraft uh, was launched, and even, even though I, I actually managed to finish my dissertation, um, but I did play a lot. I played about 150 hours of gameplay guided to um, collecting observations for my own uh, research. Uh, that, so the 150 hours were just for my dissertation. The, the other hours were um, not for my dissertation. So, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the most interesting things, I played from the beta to um, one of the latest patches. but one of the interesting things was that I, I was playing on a player versus player server. This was my character. Um, it was a tiny uh, gnome uh, that was a warlock. And I, I enjoyed being on a player versus player server because I thought it was thrilling to have that kind of agonistic competitive play in this role-playing universe. I wanted to be able to be killed by other players. Because I knew, I, it was a hypothesis but that was confirmed from beta to launch, that players are not idiots. Players are not necessarily <laughs> idiots. I mean, there's everything everywhere but they are not necessarily harassers. Um, there's a minority of players that are griefers that will harass you when playing, but there's a large majority of players that will engage with the game and create some kind of um, uh, conventional, agreed upon, not written moral system. And in order to explore that moral system, I played on a player versus player server. And of course, at the beginning uh, of my experience playing the game, Sometimes you got killed by players who were on a much higher level. But that didn't happen often. Well, when you met a player from the opposite uh, um, side, when you play, I, I was playing Alliance, so when I, played, uh, when I found a, a Horde player that was much stronger than me, typically they just let me go. Because there was no challenge in it, right? There was no, there was no, there was no value in attacking another player. Uh, just because you could beat them. The game system did not provide any kind of rewards and um, the community decided that, well, you know, 
we are going to just fight fair fights. And then I think it was patch 1.7, I think, uh, now I'm quoting by memory, uh, Blizzard decided to create something called the honor system, in which players would get experience points and rewards by killing other players. So it was not just PvP, it was PvP rewarded uh, systemically. And this just totally broke the system. This, this conventional ethical discourse that, that the game had created. Because suddenly, you were rewarded for performing an action, attacking players of a much lower level, that before that was considered, maybe unethical is a big word, but it was considered bad style. Bad style is a, is a, is a word that we use also to uh, denote some of the virtues we have as players. And suddenly, there was this really interesting discussion within the community saying, even if we get points, we should not do it, because it breaks the spirit of the game. The spirit of the game, well, it was one of the first times that players were using this kind of vague notion of the spirit of the game in a meaningful way. So what, what happened there was, um, to me, a, a, a sort of an illustration of how even if you create a system that rewards players for a particular action, a system that connects to one of our most classical uh, uh, attractions for play, which is to play against other people. The community will pull back and say, well, no, we have community values, we play here together, we want to do this in a particular way. Even if you get rewards, you should not engage in that activity. So I saw that last element of, of, of this uh, hermeneutic circle at play. Um, the, the role of communities in how we want to play. And of course, communities in video games are getting messier and are getting nastier. Um, but uh, there's a still hope. I'm very optimistic. I think that players in general, except for a minority of vocal uh, uh, trolls, players in general are just sort of interesting, decent human beings that want to play in particular ways with others and have fun, enjoy, and have some, some measure of pleasure with other people. So um, this was my corroboration that actually there's an element of of cooperative uh, pleasures in it. And DEFCON, uh, which is a thermonuclear war uh, multiplayer game, was another good example of um, uh, design. So this game is, is multiplayer, uh, uh, up to eight players can, I think it's eight, uh, control nations and then the goal is to exterminate all the others uh, in thermonuclear war. And the, so the interesting thing is that the game is designed, the winner is the one that loses the least. So the winner is, I've only lost, you know, 72 million people, yay! When I, I ran a controlled study of this game, asking some of my graduate students to play it and see their reactions, they had not played it before. So interestingly enough, they loved playing it competitively. It had all these elements of fun, of pleasure, of hedonism. But at the same time, when they finished playing, they were still exhilarated, but they knew, okay, this is terrible, right? They were laughing, but they also knew this is absolutely, you know, it's madness. Nuclear war is absolute madness. It's something that we all know, but the game reinforced, not necessarily by putting an educational layer on top of it. It, it reinforced it by um, triggering a particular type of, of uh, a classic game experience to win over others, but instead of designing how uh, victory is a positive thing, victory was designed as a negative thing. It was the design of, of a victorious defeat. It's a Pyrrhic victory that was designed. And that was, that was particularly interesting to me because it showed me, well, we can actually design games that are fun, that are engaging, that are commercial, and yet appeal to our moral being, that, that engages morally that engage this individual player and wants us to take uh, um, decisions using our moral minds, using our own player subject, uh, ethical player subject. And that's kind of what brought me to uh, my next part of research, which is how do we design this stuff? Taking as an assumption that players are moral beings and that most of the time um, or all the time we are playing as moral agents, but sometimes that moral agency takes a role in the way we play the game, how can we design so this role can be effectively engaged, challenged? Not all films are moral films, but some films are made for engaging our moral, uh, uh, or, or our moral being. 
Not all books are uh, moral pamphlets, but some books are also written to debate issues on morality. How do we do that with video games? And most interestingly, for me, how can we do it for games that are commercial, fun and engaging? I don't want to do chocolate-covered broccoli. I don't want to do educational games. I don't want to inject myself into that community because they are doing a great job, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in a $60 million video game produced by Electronic Arts that appears, appeals to our moral being. Like, can that happen? And the answer is, of course, yes, if we design it right. So I started with this uh, idea. Can we design games that appeal to the moral subject? And of course, it was a, it's a tricky question, right? Of course, I think so. But um, probably if I asked you, what video games engage us morally? How do video games engage us morally? You would all say, well, you give the player some choices. And then you put some that are good and some that are evil. And then if they choose the evil ones, you're engaging them with these evil type of choices, right? It's, um, um, this uh, choose your own adventure books uh, I grew up with. The history of the design of choices is the history of failures. Because it's true. There's something about how video games are structured and how ethical dilemmas are presented, particularly in, in, in um, sort of more theoretical philosophy, that, that seems to be kind of the same thing, right? The trolley problem is a video game of sorts, but they are not interesting. I mean, the trolley problem is interesting, but the way we've designed choices is absolutely, mostly boring. Because when we are playing a game, as players, we are almost all the time trying to minimax systems. We are trying to read how does this particular system work. We are going to see a pattern, and as soon as we identify that pattern, we move through it. Some patterns in this kind of moral choice video game, some patterns are going to be, that's, that's the good moral choice, and then you move on the good moral way. And then some others are, that's bad choices. And then you move in the I'm an evil character kind of choice. But do you actually really think you're evil? Or you're just taking a particular branch of a story? What does it mean to be evil? What does it mean to be a good character? Right? We are interacting with a fictional discourse on morality, but we are not engaging necessarily our moral being. Because as players, we are trained, we are educated, and we are in practice of seeing how the topology of the system works. If you design video games uh, that want to engage players morally and you design them around conventional choices, you're just forcing players to create a topology of a system, of a branching system. And that's, intuitively, that's the way we should be doing it, but it doesn't work. Because we just explore. To play, to play it's to explore these topologies. But to play morally is to engage with these topologies, to be deeply affected by them, to take choices that are not optimal, but morally sound, morally solid. Choices that perhaps disgust us, choices that perhaps we would have never taken, but we take them because it makes sense from a moral point of view, not from a gameplay point of view. I want to... Um, I want to have video games about ethics that design against design. So I'm deeply, I'm deeply influenced by a body of work on, on third wave HCI, uh, pioneered by Anthony Dunn and, and uh, Bill Gaber, that basically try to break all this uh, classic idea that design should be easily communicating what the, play or what the user needs to do all the time, and the more informed choices we have, and the more we can interact with a system, uh, the, the best or the better design it will be. And we've taken this idea of optimization and we've translated it into games saying like, you know, players should always know why they take a choice. Players should always know what the consequences of a choice could be. Players should always know what their status in the game is and what the status could be. Players should always know. That's, that's sort of second wave HCI video game design. Players should always know. And to that I'm saying, no, no, that's, forget about it. We are patronizing players. I mean, if you want to design Tetris, that's okay. But if you want to design morally engaging video games, we cannot 
let the player know what they have to do. Because how do they know it? If you think about the hermeneutic circle, they are going to know first by their history of playing games. They don't not, you don't need to engage morally with a game if you know how it's going to work, if you know what the outcome could be. If you have a clear idea of the topology of those choices. You're just doing shopping. You're just shopping around for what the consequences are. What does this designer think that bad consequence is, a bad choice is? You're not thinking, what do I think a bad choice is? How am I? You're never putting anything that is personal, individual, moral at stake. These games are easily seen through. So um, instead of designing systems or designing video games, that are clearly laid out where we have no, you know, the Jedi's on one side and the Sith Lords on the other side, or that we have uh, the Paragon and the Renegades, or that we have good and evil, or, or Nazis and allies, or whatever you want to have. We need to have systems open for interpretation. Then you, you cannot have any kind of authorial voice telling you this is a particular way that I'm deeming positive, and this is a particular way that I'm defining as negative. The system should be presented to the player as, as it is. And you know, go ahead, get lost. We never tell players in video game design, when I teach video game design, we never tell players, go ahead and get lost, right? If I tell this to, me, to my students, they would say like, oh, but you would flunk us if we do that. Well, yes, if you want to create just sort of engaging fun video games, but if you want to engage them morally, they need to be morally lost. You, we need to lose players. We need to give them all the instruments to be able to play the game, but fewer instruments to understand the moral being or the moral structure of the game. And we should provide them with solutions that are not satisfactory. We should annoy players, basically. We should troll players. If we want them to be morally engaged, they can, it cannot be that it's easy, oh, we take this solution because it's the most logical, the most efficient, the most consequent. No. Solutions need to be uh, not satisfactory. They do not need to sit comfortably in a pre-designed discourse. Conventional interpretations should not be a default. There should not be a, a moral good and a moral evil by default in any game. It's up to the player to decide what's good and what's bad. Not up to us as designers. Because the players are creative stewards in the game. They are not they are not guided by the hand of the designer telling a moral story. They should build it themselves. If I, I don't know if any of you wants to be a game designer or is a game designer. Maybe I'm, I'm just uh, um, you know, stepping on your territory. But game designers are not authors. At best, you're playground designers. You make a space for players to express themselves, to explore themselves. Game designers are not authors. They are. It's a, it's a different type, I mean, we, you know, in our culture, author, authorial intent is very important, but not for video games. Players are the artists. So, how do we do this more um, practically? So, I, I nicked a concept from urbanism or urban planning called wicked problems. So, in urbanism, wicked problems are all of those problems that are so complicated that any kind of solution for that problem will involve taking a moral stance. Like, how do you design social housing? How do you design green spaces? How do you design for integration of minorities in spaces? How do you design for new areas of cities to be opened up or closed down? Those are not easy problems to solve. And a couple of uh, urban theorists in the 1970s, they, they decided that those problems should be called wicked problems because they have no easy solution. And at some moment, regardless of how well-trained a designer is, there's going to be a designer imprint and a designer moral choice in that particular solution. And that's what we should be designing. We should be designing uh, challenges for players in which they have some information, but not enough information to be absolutely certain of what the outcome will be. So if, they, if a player needs to take a particular decision, they will need to supplement whatever information the game gives with their own moral being. And sometimes it will go wrong. We need to design wicked problems for video games. I'll give you an example of a wicked problem from Fallout 3, my favorite example ever. I love this quest. I don't know if any of you played Fallout 3. No, anyway. So 
Fallout 3, it's a, it's a dystopian video game that takes place in, a, in the world after um, many years after a, a nuclear holocaust where uh, some people survived by living underground on, on particular vaults and the player character, so the character the player controls it's a, is one of these survivors that actually goes out in this wasteland and starts exploring the world. There's a, there's a MacGuffin that says that you have to go out for some reason. Uh, I don't even remember what, what reason makes you go out in Fallout 3, but who cares? Um, so while, while playing this sort of open, vast environment, um, on my first playthrough, without knowing anything about the game, I, um, I got to this place called the Tempeni Tower. Um, and the Tempeni Tower is a, is a building in this fictional universe where um, a person called Tempeni managed to recreate the world as it was before the, the, the nuclear holocaust. And he did so uh, by pleasing everybody who was in, so typically the rich. This is a sort of a, a 1% uh, metaphor, right? The 1% lives in there and they live as they were before uh, the war. But they, uh, Tempeni keeps them from rebelling by saying that there's a threat outside. There's um, some um, deformed monsters or people that survive the radiation and, uh, and that are deformed that are out there and they just want to take everything from you. So this place inside is kind of a militaristic environment controlled with iron fist by this Tempeni thanks to the threat of, of these sort of deformed uh, human beings that are outside lurking. So when you get into this uh, mission, you're going to be given basically three choices. You can either work with Tempeni and exterminate all the, all the deformed people that are outside and help him continue with his uh, control of, of the world. You can, uh, of, of this tower, sorry. Uh, you can help the uh, deformed creatures from the outside slaughter all the human beings inside and let them take possession of the Tempeni Tower because uh, who should be living with so many riches without sharing? It's morally wrong. Or um, try to break an agreement where they can, you know, try to live together. And I'm kind of a kumbaya, can we get along together type of player, right? So of course I took what I, I'm also a, a sort of a, a virtue ethicist, so I thought virtue is in the middle. I'm going to use all my gameplay energy taking that choice. I'm going to try to help break an agreement between these two factions and see if they can live together happily ever after. So I, I completed some quests and by the end of these quests the characters said like, oh, okay, well we are going to give it a shot, we are going to try to live together and happily ever after. That was great. So then I finished that mission, I went uh, you know, walking around, did some other things and a couple of hours later I came back to the tower and the deformed creatures had slaughtered all the humans. Because of course, now they, they had a way in, so they had to kill everybody. Because they were morally wrong. So I thought I had done the most virtuous thing. And I didn't know that it could, be, it could end up that way. In any other video game, what I did would be, you know, I would, I would gain Gandhi status. Like you helped broker peace in, with these two conflicting factions. In this game, I couldn't. And from this moment on, all choices were wicked problems. Because I didn't know how this twisted moral universe would work. So from the Tempeni Tower quest on, my moral being was involved in taking any particular decision in my gameplay of Fallout 3. I couldn't anymore try to think about just uh, what the consequences of this action will be in terms of gameplay. I also had to say, okay, what kind of human being do I want to be in this game? What kind of player do I want to be in this game? And that meant taking choices that sometimes were not good, morally good, but they were in agreement with the type of person I wanted to be in this universe. Again, I couldn't see the consequences of my actions and for that type of blindness, for that impossibility of seeing the future, I could engage with this game morally. And that's what we need to do. We need to blind the players from the structures of the game so they can engage with it morally. And as designers, I came up with sort of a bunch of uh, questions that we can ask a particular element of our designs to see um, how will this particular wicked situation or wicked problem work. So as a designer, once you want to, in, in those situations in which you want to engage the player moral or the, the player subject as a moral being, the virtues of the player, you should ask how is that particular situation a wicked problem? Does the player have 
enough information or don't they? And if they have enough and you want to create a wicked problem, take some information from them. Lie to them. Cheat them. They, they like it. If you do it right, they will like it. <laughs> and if you don't do it right, well, you know, you can blame me. Um, is the challenge in the rules of the game, so are you going to make a systemic challenge because some rules are um, impossible to foresee, some rules are unfair, or is this a challenge that it's going to be in the game world fiction? So are you going to in introduce an element in the fictional uh, constitution of the game that will challenge, that will present itself as a wicked problem? Or in the context of play, are you going to make a multiplayer game that it's so asymmetrical that players will need to see how they treat each other morally? I think, by the way, that's mo one of the most interesting areas and mostly unexplored areas. Multiplayer ethical gameplay. Uh, particularly local multiplayer ethical gameplay. I think that's a, that's a, a context very rich for design. Um, as, a play, as a designer, you should always uh, figure out how much that the situation the player faces change with any choice taken and then reflect how does this change is communicated to the player and how much of this change is communicated to the player. The less you communicate, the more they will try to, players will try to fill up with their moral being if the question is presented as a moral question. And finally, and very polemically, with, I did some interview work with um, game designers that are interested in this topic, and they all, they all had opinions about reloading. Because obviously in any video game you just save, reload from the last save and you can take new choices. Um, so one of the design keys for creating ethical gameplay is to design a topology of possibilities in which backtracking is not possible. So if you want to, if you want to create a particular wicked problem in, in a topology point here, uh, the, 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 if players want to re replay, they need to go so far back that it's not going to be worth for them to go far back. And if they do, you've already affected them morally, so that's great. <laughs> so anyway, this, this, is, this is a little bit of, a, of an overview of how I think we can design more interesting, more engaging ethical gameplay in video games. But as a coda, and I'm, I need to finish, um, I wanted to think about the relationship between play and ethics, and, and it's complicated. The relationship status between play and ethics is complicated, and the person to blame is uh, Johann Huisinger. So the, the grandfather of play studies uh, in our, in our uh, culture, who wrote at the end of Homo Ludens uh, in the 1938 version, uh, play lies outside the antithesis of wisdom and folly, and equally outside those of truth and falsehood, good and evil. Although it's, not, it's a, it's a non-material activity, it has no moral function. Um, I've been battling with this, it has no moral function, for the last 16 years, so uh, great. Um, mostly when we think about play, we don't think about play as a moral activity. We think about play as leisure, play as hedonism, play as an activity that it's outside good and evil. And I want to, s I want to bring back a romantic theory of play that says, no, 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 to play can be to be a moral being in the world. And for that, I quickly, uh, I wrote um, in Play Matters that play is a mode of being in the world. It's not an action, it's not an activity. It's, a, it's, it's almost an ontology. It's a mode of being in the world in which we appropriate the world to express ourselves as individuals. And even though it has its own goals, play is autotelic, these are goals that we are constantly negotiating. So to play is not just uh, to entertain ourselves. It's to be in the world at play, but to be in the world for appropriative, to take over the world, and expressive goals, to express ourselves. I'm a romantic here. Um, why does this matter? Okay, so very quickly, we are seeing um, a proliferation of gameful worlds and playful services. Everybody wants to be uh, gamified, quantified, one win badges, points, all of, the, all of this stuff, right? So we, our world is taking a turn to look more and feel more like something we play with. Probably a game, and that's why games are terrible. Um, and to me, this is particularly problematic because we are adding a layer of, adding a topology of, of gameness without thinking about uh, how play can be a, a mode of expressing ourselves with that uh, technology, with that topology. And as such, what I want to think is, or what I want, the provocation I want to throw at you right before I finish is, that playing can be a form of ethical action in this gameful world. 
and that to play can be a form of ethical resistance in this gameful world. This is Banksy right, writing, Banksy before he became a parody of himself, writing control alt delete on the Gaza wall. That's the wall between uh, the Palestinian state and Israel. And he made a graffiti write control alt delete. That's to play. That's a playful activity. It's not a game, it's play. It's very playful. This is my favorite art project of the last many, 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 many decades. Uh, that's called News Tweak, and it's a tiny device that will intercept your um, wireless communication with news sites and modify the headers. So if you go to bbc.com, uh, it will modify the headlines of the news you see. Because everything we see on a screen, downloaded from the internet, it's true, right? Except it's not true. It can be intercepted, modified. It's just an element on a network. These two are playful appropriations of the world. These two are playful elements of resistance to discourses that are dominant. To play in the world is to act ethically, to act upon a series of values, to appropriate the world and express who we are and make fun of it. It's a carnival. And like in the Middle Ages carnival, you know, we poke fun at, at institutions. What's more fun than poking, you know, at religion, kings, societies? So to play is to uh, act ethically, not only when we play games, but also when we play games. Thank you. Thank you.